Hmm. Let's see who turns up. We had a 20, how many register? 22 register, I think. Cool. And some brands, actually. Yeah, there's like True Alliance and um, who else was there? There was a couple of brands that we've connected with over the past few months. So. Um, Gary Shaw told me he was going to join in. Okay. From Kathmandu. So, oh, wow. okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, we'll see. Yes. We'll you see. won't pick your brain. So, yes, yeah. Just watching <laughs> audience, but great. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Just, to, oh, okay. Um, I've been trying to do some business with True Alliance, but they've, um, anyway, got, you know, I think COVID's affected a lot of people. So, totally. Yeah. yeah. Focus areas. All right. I can't actually see who's um, joining. No one's joining. How can I see if no one's joining? I just stop sharing for a minute. Bring up the participants. That's it. That's what I want. Share my screen. Well, welcome to those who are just uh, uh, joining us, uh, logging in. Uh, thank you for turning up early and with two minutes to go. So we'll just uh, we'll give it a little bit, uh, a couple of more minutes uh, just to see, uh, yeah, give people an opportunity to finish whatever they're doing, lunch or other meetings, and so they can uh, join the webinar. Great. Well, uh, thank you to, for all those who are joining us. Um, we'll get started probably just in another 30 seconds or so, just to enable uh, other people to uh, join join the meeting, uh, join the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to, yeah, to a great discussion. Right.
Okay, well, uh, welcome uh, to our Unchaining Modern Slavery series. Uh, we're really pleased that you've been able to join us, and we trust that our content today will be current, relevant, and helpful uh, to you. I'm Dr. Stephen Morse, founder of uh, Unchained Solutions. Unchained inspires Australian organisations to be leaders in making an impact on modern slavery. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country, recognising that people are joining us from many parts, uh, even outside Australia. So today I'm speaking um, from the Garigal country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Unchained acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, the sea and community. And we pay our respect to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So Unchained hosts these webinars with a view to advancing the conversation on the issue of modern slavery in order to help uh, organisations and individuals uh, to go deeper with the implementation of the Modern Slavery Act uh, and, in our words, to find a way to lead beyond compliance. Uh, this is a special webinar today because this is a, an anniversary webinar. Uh, we began this series back in October 2020, uh, and it's just been a great uh, year of uh, interviewing a whole range of panellists um, from, from many backgrounds uh, to get different perspectives on the topic of modern slavery and what companies in particular can do to address this issue in their supply chains and operations. Uh, you may uh, have received, uh, if you booked early enough, uh, our pre-webinar uh, poll, uh, just some short questions, uh, just to sort of prompt you and, uh, and, and get you thinking about today's uh, webinar in particular. And we also have a LinkedIn group, Unchaining Modern Slavery Bus Business Group, uh, in which we invite you to, to join and also uh, follow uh, Un Unchained as well. Uh, we also invite you to use the chat to ask questions, uh, and hopefully we can answer at least some of these uh, in the time that we have. Uh, if not, we can also respond to your questions in an email. And um, yeah, we're also happy uh, for you to reach out to us following the webinar and that we'll have some details uh, after this session. So yeah, it's a great pleasure today uh, to welcome Lisa Lohai from Out Outland Denim. Uh, Lisa is the Social and Environmental Impact Manager for Outland, uh, based in Southeast Queensland. Uh, as many of you know, Adland is a leading provider of sustainable fashion uh, with a strong commitment uh, to ethical sourcing and manufacturing. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to uh, talk about Adland as a sustainable brand, its story so far and where it's heading with the aim of inspiring you uh, to become a more conscious consumer and uh, who knows, uh, even to start your own sustainable brand just, you know, plant a seed uh, out there. So welcome, Liesl. Um, It's a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It feels like such an honour to get to share a bit of our journey because it's been a wild one, but it's um, been incredibly worth it. So, yeah, thank you for letting us share a bit about what we've been learning and doing over the years. Perfect. Great. Well, look, I'll, I, no one can probably introduce you better than yourself. So perhaps if you could uh, yeah, just introduce yourself, uh, a bit about you personally, professionally, um, yeah, and your role at Outland. Yeah, sure. Well, I came along about eight years ago. So the founder, James, had already started developing this idea um, of creating employment, particularly for people that had experienced um, trafficking and other forms of exploitation. So when I came along, the first couple of years of development were already underway. Um, my role initially started based here in Australia, but after several months, um, James said to me, one of us needs to move to Cambodia. James is the founder of Outland Denim. He said, one of us needs to move to Cambodia. Um, he said, it's you or me. We didn't have a big team. <laughs> so <laughs> options were very limited. And I said, I'm willing, but I hadn't come from a manufacturing background. I'd actually come from um, the film industry of all places, oh, right. sort of coordinating production roles. So I said, I'm willing to go and, and learn and do what what I can try to do. Um, however, you know, you, you might be better. However, at the time, his wife was um, expecting their first baby. So he nominated me and off I went. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, in the deep end. And so we were really learning how to set up um, this enterprise. Uh, at the time, we were set up as a, as a not-for-profit. We hadn't set up as a business yet. So we're really learning how to set up 
our um, facilities in a province in rural Cambodia and um, how to work with a different people group, different mm. culture. Mm. Um, so we had a lot to learn. So my role initially started with more of an operations role and I'd go back and forward between Australia and Cambodia. Um, and then in more recent years, I've moved into social and environmental impact. So um, that involves how we holistically looking after and developing um, the team that we work with in our facilities that we've set up in in Southeast Asia and then also looking into that full supply chain um, of the brand and seeing how those suppliers what their standards are like socially and environmentally um, who we can work with working for transparency and and so on so the role has taken many forms and shapes oh, over the wow. years but that's where we're at at the moment yeah, well, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, just what you've just said there at a very high level, um, yeah, there's a tremendous amount to unpack. Uh, having, you know, lived and worked uh, overseas in another country, uh, and well, and not, to, not to start up a business, um, just that alone, I can imagine um, all the, uh, the uh, rules and regulations and red tape and all the intricacies and details of setting up your operations in another, another country, which was also not... For example, you have you know doesn't speak English as its um, you know as its home language, first language. Um, that yeah, that alone. Uh, yeah, on our got, toes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all these ideas just bouncing around my head around just that alone. Let alone then going on and developing you know a product and 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 measuring you know uh, the impact and and taking into account all the factors that go into um, being a sustainable product. So that's a lot to consider and juggle uh, for, for any brand coming from any country to go into another country and then set that up. Um, mm. so that's remarkable. So yeah, it's been a great journey and it's been greatly good to, to track Outland um, and, and the journey that it's had. So great. So yeah, I suppose, what does it mean then uh, for Outland to be a sustainable brand? Mm. Well, it's definitely an ongoing process, as you can imagine. Um, it, it has to be an ongoing journey of just continually improving. But for us, we really believe it has to consider social, environmental and economic impact. And so that's been um, something over the years we've been really trying to understand more and how every action and decision is having this ripple effect on, on so many. Um, so many that we directly know, but then there's also, of course, those that we don't have direct um, contact with that our, in, our decisions are still impacting. So having that, I guess, triple bottom line, as, as we say, of um, social, environmental and economic impact is so important to consider how each of those are affected um, with each decision. But it's really it's ongoing. So for any brand to say they've made it would be a complete lie. Um, and for us, it's just going to be yeah an ever-growing journey just to continue to look for better ways and better processes and um, systems of, of doing business, particularly in the fashion industry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was there a starting point for all that um, that kind of discovery work to be? Was there a, like I suppose a, a list of priorities that you first mm. started with? Well, we definitely started with uh, the desire to meet this social need that was um, so evident, particularly in this area of Southeast Asia, where we'd initially sort of um, met some people that had had the experiences of trafficking and other forms of exploitation, and then setting up the facilities to create employment there, but realising there was so much more needed than just the job. Um, so that sort of then built out the model, but really the social is that initial focus mm -hmm. as to why the business began and yeah. then learning how much that impacted the environmental as well and how much they're impacting each other and they really have to go hand in hand yeah. has sort of led us to grow and expand to really start monitoring, looking into and partnering with um, those that are prioritizing the impact there, both environmentally and socially as well. So it's so I'd say definitely that social focus initially and then realizing how important it has to link into our environmental impact and how our environmental impact will have such an impact on people socially and in the communities we work in. Yeah. Um, so started to broaden that approach for us. Sure. How many people work um, work on the ground in Cambodia? Like how many people? About 130. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. Wow. So and what, and what it was about four or five. Um, when I came along. Oh, wow. Okay. So we've got about 130 now. So, majority women, but we also work with some men as well. Um, and we have two facilities. So, we've got the cut and sew facility that we've set up in the province and the wash and finishing facility in, in the city. Wow. Okay. 
Oh, so it's yeah, it's a, a growing growing operation, and uh, I know you've done a lot of uh, you know crowdfunding uh, campaigns mm -hmm. as well. So it's been great to see that and to be able to support that, and and I hope that yeah that uh, you can continue to get the support that you need to grow to grow the operations and to yeah to expand in into into different in different fields. I'm wondering, um, just uh, I suppose, just um, can you maybe give us an example of one of the social challenges? Um, you know, mm -hmm. just being in a, in a in a local context in in a village, you know, in mm -hmm rural Cambodia, what um, what are some of the case studies, what are some of the issues um, that you mm. came across? Yeah, I would say we've just, we come across new challenges all the time. I, I think a large one that I really had to readjust my thinking around um, was around what we, perhaps coming from Australia, for example, view as success and the empowerment of somebody. And then also understanding that our values are going to differ from the people in, in, a, in a different culture, in a different location. So really sort of learning what um, their values are and that our values aren't the way to determine um, success or empowerment or um, financial freedom, even how we'd spend our money or how we'd want to see um, savings occur is going to look different in different communities as to what they value mm -hmm. and so I think a huge part has been understanding differing values and that being a driving factor in how we how we communicate how we do business relationships personal relationships um, and that's an ongoing learning journey as well it feels like after eight years just scratching the surface of understanding <laughs> the, how big the cultural differences are yeah. um, and every time I'd land on the ground in Cambodia I'd have to Re realize that a lot of my thinking's being shaped from the way I've been raised and the communities of people I've been in. So getting there and having to reset and just listen and learn yep. to really understand what the needs are and yeah, and start to learn better ways to be part of solutions. So a big, a big empathy piece uh, and uh, in many ways uh, a co-creation mm. dynamic as well. So Very it's not just about so. coming in with our ideas of how things yeah. ought to be or should be, um, what they should look like and the timing of that, uh, yeah. but to actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, to listen and to, and learn, to learn. It reminds me of, uh, I did a little bit of work in northern um, Sulawesi in Indonesia some years ago wow. now with the community, not too much, nothing yeah. compared to the work that you've been doing in Cambodia, uh, but just even that, just that touch point of uh, taking a group there to support a community of displaced peoples uh, and, uh, you know, going there in the first year, uh, we had someone on the team and they were very keen to know, to get all the answers. Like, like hey, so you, the, the government's granted you this field and so how are you going to clear it and how are you going to terrace it, how are you going to irrigate it, how are you going to build? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Like where are you going to get the materials from? And you know, there was just no response. And it was quite frustrating uh, for, for that person, but I uh, was curious as we went the next next year and they'd done it, you know, they'd cleaned mm. the land, they'd terraced it, they'd started building the foundations for the building, they'd irrigated, they'd put in um, the structures. And it's like, you know, it's just amazing. Um, I think the lesson for me in that was just, you know, just learning, being prepared to uh, in, entering into those contexts. To you know, I don't, I don't come with all the answers. In fact, I come mm. as a as a as a learner, uh, and I come as one who uh, as a as a co creator. You know, someone who can support, but actually, the 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 DNA or of of success mm -hmm. is it lies with the people that we're working with. I don't know if that's Absolutely. your experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Outland definitely can't itself empower anybody, but the staff pick up the tools around them and really start to make amazing change in, in their lives and their children and the community. And so um, understanding that's, I think, so important, like you say. Yeah. I suppose out of curiosity, how, how, um, how was Outland received uh, by the people that you're, by the community that you're planting yourself in, uh, mm. in, in Cambodia? How was it received? And um, what were maybe some of the uh, tensions that that came of that or opportunities or how yeah what can you give give us some more insight mm. into that yeah that's a good question I haven't been asked before how it was received <laughs> by the local community that's a really great question um there's definitely been uh, a sense of employees have described feeling very like proud to share that they work with Outland Denim and particularly if someone had come from an experience of perhaps um experience abuse or um, a situation that could have an impact in such a strong honor shame culture, um, have some negative impacts, being able to become, and this isn't just an outland thing, but being, a, being able to become like a consistent provider for that household really um, puts them into a place of 
receiving honour and um, watching sort of that that shift for employees and then into their communities um, was really powerful to see. Definitely, um, there's a lot of when we were doing home visits, one one trip to Cambodia and any staff that were happy for us to, um, we'd, we'd come and visit in the home and having the chance to thank the employee in front of their family and community for their work and just saying how much we appreciate having them as part of the team really had um, an impact on how that person um, felt just being publicly honoured in front of their community, um, mm-hmm. but also how the community, I guess, felt towards them. And so just learning things about how important, I guess, that honour is in, in that culture and, and in every culture, but of course, particularly in such a strong honour and shame um, environment, just sort of learning how we could honour the team through the business, mm-hmm. um, and honour them in their communities and in um yeah, their, their environments where they live. So I would say uh, it seems to have been received um, well. There's probably so many dynamics to that as well that we wouldn't always be aware of. Um, but from, from my experience, it's been something word of mouth spreads quickly mm. about the factory. Um, and so people do come to the facility a lot asking if there's spaces and work and wanting to sort of change that environment if they've experienced another, okay. say, garment factory. Um, so, so that's been positive. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I suppose one of the, um, given the the complexity of what you're doing and how you're you're operating, um, on the one hand, you're wanting to make products that are ethically mm-hmm. sourced, um, both from a social and environmental perspective, uh, and then you're also tr- you're working trying to work with um, you know um, local Cambodians uh, from all walks, walks of backgrounds. Um, I, you know, from what I understand about Adelaide, you're not just working with, say, survivors of trafficking. Um, uh, you, you work with a range of people. Um, is, yeah. is, that, is that true? Like, how does that? Yeah, that, that that's okay. very true. So initially, it was only employees that had actually been referred through anti-trafficking partners. But um, over the years, the doors have opened much wider. Some people have come more with a physical disability, and that's what was making um, earning an income and getting a job difficult for them. And then others have actually come straight from other garment um, factories and have have come looking for a better environment, um, better, better rates. Hearing about some of the some of the benefits around education and things like that as well. So different backgrounds and reasons these days. Um, often, so the priority is in bringing in people that have actually been referred through these um, partners and trafficking partners and making space for them. But there also has to be a mix of skill levels to be sustainable and to be efficient and to sort of grow the skill levels of the team. So bringing in people that have experience, but also people that maybe haven't worked in the gum industry before, and then taking them through a training program with more experienced staff members um, has been part of that model that we've been working on too. And as in the mix of that, then have you got um, other nationals? Um, so Australians and people from other countries? Not many. <laughs> we have over the years. We've had um, Aussie team members on the ground, um, as you know, and we currently have a couple of um, expat staff, as they call them, in country. And we've got um, a Turkish wash technician and an Australian lady who does a lot of our um, critical paths and planning between the Australian production team and the local production team in Cambodia. So, um, but leadership now is... Um, Cambodian and female led so that's been so exciting to have to have that sort of happen because it's been the transition we've wanted to have over the years so um COVID helped speed that up (laughs) (laughs) fantastic in terms and so those um those nationals are then uh in positions of leadership and are being trained that's fantastic that's yeah that's that's been exciting to see and watching people that have sort of started on a particular team move into the leadership of that team um or assistant leader and hearing the staff share about how proud they've been to have that happen has been great to to hear as well perfect now obviously we know that um you know the um the risks um Around say forced labor and modern slavery are not uh, are not localized uh, in, to Cambodia, particularly when it comes to apparel. Um, so, how maybe you could then describe what um, yeah what other activities are, are involved in terms of you know your due diligence um, so in your sourcing of your your raw materials or your um, yeah the fabric or where that's all coming from. How does that all play out? Yeah, sure. Well, as we're looking over the supply chain of the brand, obviously we do get a lot of insight into our own facilities being that first tier, but 
we felt the area of greatest risk for us as a brand would actually be furthest from our reach as well. Um, so we sort of went straight to the ground um, and we started looking into the organic cotton farm region that the cotton that's going into the denim we're buying is, um, is coming from and felt that the seasonal and migrant worker communities would be at highest risk um, of, of that supply chain. And as well, I guess, it being so far from our reach as a brand, our insights are so much more limited. So we have been actually working on um, what started as a pilot but has opened into more of an enduring program now on a program that locally in, in Turkey we call Sar Salim. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've set it up to, initially it was actually during um, when COVID was really hitting hard, it was just communicating information around safety and prevention. Uh, but then the channel sort of opened even wider to actually reach that target group of these seasonal migrant workers um, to educate on various human rights issues, but also ask for their input into the situation for them on that level of the supply chain. So over time, been able to build data and um, both communicate, but also hear back from this seasonal migrant worker community in the region, uh, and then take that to other brands and stakeholders and say, let's let's start to do something about these issues. Um, it's a, it's a different mindset, but we feel like we have to actively look for what the issues are. We can't assume that they're not there or hope that they're not there. Mm -hmm. We've got to assume that they are and then actively look to prove that so we can start to, to do something about it. So it's a different way of thinking, but we think that it's probably, well, it is the, the way it has to be done now mm -hmm. to really have a genuine impact. And that desire has to be there initially for that genuine impact. So is that investigation, is that, um, is the other resources of that coming internally or do you need to outsource uh, to other organisations or working mm. partnerships and collaboration? How does that, how does that play out? Yeah, well, initially when we first had a conversation, we met with a group called Precision Solutions Group. And so Richard from Precision Solutions had experience with um, investigating uh, um, modern slavery mm. and sort of looking into networks that, um, can lead to it and so he had I guess that know-how as a brand that wasn't our background um, however we had the desire to to be a force for good and have our supply chain actually um, lead people in a better place than how we found them rather than being part of the problems and so we kind of combined forces and developed this this, this pilot that started for three months mm -hmm. and then the impact was kind of blew us away because we were directly as a brand now hearing from that very group that we felt was at high risk, but also so far from our reach um, and then building that information. So I think working with other experts is really so important. And then we started sharing with brands to say, would you, we share the same supply chain. So would you want to work with us on this? Cause we yeah. can scale our impact. We could have more leverage with suppliers. We could also um, share the cost burden as well yeah. with something mm -hmm. like this. Yep. So the hope is that we can invite as many brands as we possibly can and also scale it to other regions. So it's not just um, where we're currently sourcing the majority of our cotton, it's also moving into other locations like India and so on. Um, and then talking with other brands that see the same gaps with certifications and audits that we yeah. see and want to start to do something a bit different to try to be part of the solution. And is there much take up of that of collaboration of, of brands working together? Uh, mm. Well, so far, uh, Nudie Jeans has had had some similar um, challenges to us when it's come to accessing that part of the supply chain. So they were um, so quick to say, we see the need, we want to do something also. So we'll, we'll work with you on, on what you've already set up. Um, so they've come on and become a, a really active partner now in chatting with our suppliers and starting to um, start new initiatives from the findings. And then yeah. And then other brands, I have to be honest, sometimes they'll say, we've got the certification, we're good. We've got other things to focus on. Yeah. So that comes down to, I guess, understanding, educating each other, being able to talk about the real issues and challenges. Because sometimes they're scary topics. Yeah. Um, like looking for problems is, is a scary thing to yeah. encourage a brand to do. Uh, but starting to also promote how that authentic communication with our consumers and customers could actually start to build more trust and start to educate on these global challenges within supply chains that um, each brand is impacted by, but they could actually be part of leading the way in starting to resolve some of these things. Sure, yeah. I suppose, is it possible to, to do it all and, and to have it all? I mean, you know, it's, uh, sustainability is such a broad issue. Mm. Uh, most, most people uh, align it, you know, 
to environmental because that's obviously where mm -hmm. often the origins of sustainability is but um i mean you talked about you had your own list of priorities so is that um is that kind of idea something you're able to share about well you know if, if, a, if a brand doesn't know what to do um mm. to get them to okay we'll start with this and then move on to that and um you know come up with i suppose a strategy over i don't know maybe two three four five years uh, mm -hmm. or more um to make to do yeah to do the process mm. well i think i mean our strategy as simple as it sounds and i guess looking where that area of greatest risk would be is a starting point but then just getting that understanding because as much as you can research online without hearing the voices of the people that are being impacted it's hard to have a really clear picture of of what the needs are um, mm. on an individual level on a community level um, perhaps say with a migrant um, a migrant community um, they might be different again to the issues and needs of the local community so we've kind of in a way almost addressed a bit like a marketing campaign of looking at how does this target demographic that we want to access um, receive information mm -hmm. but how are they already doing that so rather than creating a brand new channel and trying to get everyone to use it looking into how they're actually already digesting information um, and then communicating out through those channels um, and opening, I guess, the lines back up to receive and to hear and to, to learn and understand. Um, and there is some amazing groups on the ground as well that you can talk to for advice that are already working on some of the issues that, that we're finding. Yep. Um, so I think as well for, for a brand, being able to sort of just start to seek some local advice, in a, if it's in a community where you don't have that personal um, input, you're not there, um, that can just those conversations can really start to help guide the thinking around some of the solutions that might be possible. But hearing hearing from the individuals, I feel would be um, a first priority. Once you sort of have that area and you know that demographic you believe to be at highest risk. Yep. Great. Okay. Wow. So while there's a lot in there to obviously to unpack and explore, I just want to sort of, I suppose, uh, look at the other side of the coin now. So what does it mean for Outland to be a sustainable brand um, facing, you know, Western markets or that's not a good expression, but the Australian market, for example, what does it mean for Outland to then project itself as a, as a sustainable brand? What does that, um, mm -hmm. how, how do you go about that? And what are, what are the opportunities and the challenges uh, for that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I, I think we're probably pulling away a little bit from the word sustainable mm -hmm. because it is a bit um, overused and I think it's quite confusing now to, to customers because they're seeing all these brands market sustainable range sustainable fiber and there's not always a lot of backing information as to why they're calling it that mm -hmm. so I think the word's getting a bit lost in the buzz mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say that has a lot of cut through as much as it perhaps did um, and that could be a bit more personal opinion but just just from <laughs> noticing I think as, I've just noticed there were a couple of the sort of um, more sort of leadership team members have also been pulling back a bit from that word okay. um, too uh, I think a challenge is how to be um, authentic in communications mm -hmm. and more traditional approaches is put best foot forward, but how to start saying, actually, you know, we're not, we're not a perfect brand. We have challenges. We've got issues. We're learning how to resolve and address and um, being able to have that authentic communication, I think is going to be so key and mm -hmm. something we still mm -hmm. are going to have to grow in yep. um, as a brand. But I'd say thus far, it's been able to communicate what is the what are the needs that we've seen try to educate on those needs um, through whether it be reports um, social media channels um, webinars interviews podcasts whatever it might be communicate firstly that that this need is huge um, i mean it's estimated that one in 130 women and girls on the planet is enslaved yeah. um, and then on the environmental side they were, were sort of um, hearing through um, the Kevin Bales research that if slavery was a country be the third largest producer of CO2. So, so we've got we've got the issues quite clearly outlined. Mm -hmm. But then I guess as a brand trying to communicate um, where are we starting, what are we doing about it, and is it working or not working? And some some things we try will have an amazing impact. We can communicate it, but some things we try won't. And yep. so it's being able to adapt and switch and, and learn how to communicate both the highs and the lows authentically, yeah. um, I think will, yeah, be, yeah, build a lot of trust. No, that's a good point. I mean, uh, I don't know if there is a better word. I don't know if, you know, ethical is a better word or, or uh, conscious conscious cons consumerism is a better word or not. Um, I mean, I often get, off, off, often get asked by, by uh, people, you know, so how can, 
what assurances um, can can I have? Um, mm. How do I know that the the uniforms that I'm now about to buy for my organization are ethically sourced? And I said, well, you know, obviously there's a level of complexity out there. There are a number of apps that do ratings. Uh, Baptist Ordave have just put out their eth ethical fashion report, mm. um, which is great, great to see. Well done, congratulations for Outland's uh, uh, achievement on that. Uh, but you know, the, but um, yeah, but yeah, there are lots of questions. Um, uh, with with apps um, and 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 how things are measured, for example, um, but it's also the true to say that um, you know not every brand can do everything. So you know, oh, brands, totally. it's, it's, so for example, they might could be that their focus could be on on well making sure they're providing a living wage or providing um, you know a really good solid work environment for their workers, uh, and they're providing a, an opportunity for people who are at risk or migrant workers to get skilled and upskilled and to actually get really some really good qualifications, which is helping them mm -hmm. to step out of cycles of poverty and exploitation. And it could be then they, they might be recycling materials, um, yeah. which will help, you know, on the other hand, so they're repurposing and things are going to landfill. So there's that, that factor, but they can't they can't necessarily do everything. Uh, and I know, for example, there, there are probably tensions with buttons and zips and, mm -hmm. and dyeing and all sorts of, you know, just the all that's involved in putting a piece, a piece of Absolutely. Uh, garment together. So, yeah, there's a lot to consider. Um, are you able to share some of those uh, tensions that, that Adeland have? Mm, yeah, absolutely. I'd say in, in that example of, I guess, raw materials, um, that's, that's a great one because there's... I know for us, we're trying to increase the use of the natural fibers and, and decrease synthetics and um, like polyester and elastane, use less and use more natural fibers. However, there's also some tensions there for us with um, the, the lifespan and of the product. Um, we've done a lot of testing on, for example, pocket lining replacement so that we can use a 100% natural pocket lining rather than having a blend of um, poly and cotton. And so, that thus far is proof that it, it is quite challenging to find this lining that is able to withstand um, wear and tear and time and washing. Mm. And so you've, you've got that tension, like you say, of um, say the lifespan of the product versus um, the fibers it's produced from. Um, so we know there are solutions and, and we'll get to them, but it, so it takes um, time and resources and I guess weighing up um, what what the priority is mm. in that situation—a product that lasts longer or a product that has um, less polyester in the pocket lining. So that's um, like one of our current challenges is, is looking for this um, this solution, as well as obviously with stretch. And and stretch isn't um, very often. There is a couple of newer um, fibers options out there now. Thus far, from from our experiences and testing, there hasn't been many strong leaders in mm -hmm. again in durability. Um, and being able to sort of withstand um, what a pair of jeans has to be able to withstand, but there is some like there is some fibers though that are able to help I guess reduce reduce that reliance on um, elastane, for example, and start to still have that bit of stretch in there, but using a more natural option. So so that's something that's quite an, an obvious one. Um, obviously, uh, using recycled fibers is a big topic as well and bringing in recycled fibers obviously that's going to have a social impact on the production of raw materials um but it's again weighing up and understanding the true impact of each decision yeah sure sure, There's sure. a lot, lot i could say on that one but <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to take all the time no no we're, no we're doing really well um and uh, some questions have come in as well so we'll, we will uh, probably have time to attend to those so i suppose um what's uh, what's next for outland what's the what's the future hold you had the duchess of sussex um you know. oh yeah <laughs> That was funny. <laughs> you in your jeans, um, quite yeah. high profile. Um, yeah, what 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 are the, some of the next, uh, what's the future for Outland? Mm, yeah, um, having Meghan Markle wear the jeans was pretty pr pretty crazy at the time. Um, we The founder actually flew over to uh, Cambodia the same day that she stepped out of the plane wearing Outland on her tour here. <laughs> so he had to fly straight back actually for some meetings <laughs> and interviews and so on. Um, so that, and then I remember showing the staff in um, Cambodia with a couple of colleagues um, photos of uh, Meghan Markle and the jeans, but it was very different to what they pictured a princess looking like. <laughs> <laughs> so it might have even been anticlimactic, um, but we were excited. Uh, but yeah, I would say... Um, uh, sorry, I just had a blank on your question. No, that's you right. Sorry, well, the future. What's the future for oh, uh, Adelaide? Yeah. 
Well, we, we see a lot of opportunity to expand the impact by actually manufacturing for others. So it's um, an area that we've started working in manufacturing for um, a couple of key other brands and using the facilities that we've set up and developed to be able to go beyond just the Outland Denim brand to actually start to, um, I guess, yeah, expand that impact through these other um, brands' channels. It definitely has to be a brand that does want to have a genuine impact, um, not to just use the story. Uh, but finding the right brands and then working on whether it be a certain range with them or, um, I mean, eventually we'd love to be able to, yeah, produce for, for many brands and employ a lot more people, um, expand the facilities that we're already working in. But we really see that as an amazing opportunity to, to grow the impact. Okay. Wow. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's exciting. So would that, um, yeah, would that entail, you know, more plants, more, um, you know, more operations set up um, to... We to have, the, yeah, it would, because we have the opportunity to scale in size where we are currently, but um, the, the greater dream would actually be to set up uh, what we've done in, in Southeast Asia in other locations also. Um, so that would be, obviously, we, we often feel like, okay, well, we need to do things well where we are before we spread thin. Um, but also, this has been such a great time to learn how to set up this model. And obviously, it'd have to be adjusted for a different culture and context and different needs of, of the area. But being able to replicate that in another region would be um, a huge goal for us. Okay. Cool, cool. Um, if you were to uh, say one thing uh, to uh, a young budding entrepreneur, um, and, and, uh, a new James Bartle, for example, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what would be one piece of advice do you think? Um, I would say, as I mentioned briefly, initially we did set up as a not-for-profit. And, and then um, several years later realised that to actually be sustainable and to create the impact we want to have to scale it and to, um, I guess, have that level of accountability, we changed to a for-profit model and actually took on investors and were able to sort of expand the facilities, bring in more employees, bring in the um, raw materials we needed, all of these sort of big cost Cost yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, realizing that actually that would have so much more impact that way um, as we sort of build, build a business that way. And so I think that was like a different a mindset shift that was quite important for us to have. And um, I think a desire for genuine impact is probably the key thing. Because when you start with that, mm -hmm. um, though it won't be a perfect start, perhaps mm -hmm. if the brand's just beginning, it won't be a perfect start, but that desire to continually look for better ways and um, again, each decision realizing the ripple effect it has. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's a mindset I think yeah. that can really start to um, that can really start to make some amazing change in an industry that is so notorious for being quite damaging, um, mm -hmm. very damaging to people and planets. So having that mindset from the beginning, I think, just gives you such an amazing platform to start on. Um, and having those conversations, say, with a supplier around why you exist and what you want your brand to stand for, mm -hmm. sort of sets the tone early. Um, I like to have those conversations really early with it, with a potential new supplier, just around who we are, why we're here and um, what we're trying to do as a brand so that it's a little bit more in context when we start digging deep and asking hard questions. Um, and so that's probably another area that I'd, I'd encourage people to, sure. to do early. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, uh, I mean, like any uh, small business, you know, having a very clear why, which is, mm. um, you know, uh, yeah, that's a good summary. <laughs> <laughs> very good clear uh, and a very strong conviction. You know, yeah. I can. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I've, I started Unchained, and so I know what it means to have started uh, a consultancy in the space, mm. uh, to have started something which has, um, you know, a, a manufacturing component uh, in another country. Um, mm. It just, uh, wow! It just, yeah, it's my my, my mind. It blows my mind. Uh, just the the, the hard, the, the grit, and and the the determination um and just yeah just powering on so there's so many yeah you know we've only scratched the surface uh, of all the things that you've been talking to, about today um just to actually to to get this going so it's really a really awesome inspiring i'm really inspired by the work that you're doing oh thank you yeah so we've had, had a couple of questions come in um so yeah, Liesl, could you talk a little bit uh, about the links between social and environmental impacts? That's uh, a question that's come in. Thanks for the question, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Oh, there's so many links. I think that initial sort of um, stat that I shared around um, the impacts actually slavery has on CO2 emissions and realising that in the fight against um, modern slavery and forms of it uh, actually has an impact environmentally also. And that's something that I think um, Kevin Bales, if you get a chance to read his um, reports, communicates really well and looks into really thoroughly. There's, there's so much impact on local community as to how we're managing environmentally. Um, obviously, everything from um, chemicals used, mm, water. So it's it really will impact the communities we work in. But then if you also think of end of life of a product, um, what type of recycle repair options, how's um, textile waste being um, disposed of? Because some uh, solutions will have a damaging impact and some solutions will actually create value. Um, so I think there's, there's so many touch points along the way. I know with... Um, even I guess with, with organic cotton and our choice with organic cotton, not wanting to sort of have the chemical use on the farms and the impact that has on, on people as well, um, both waterways and the people that are actually farming. So there's, there's many touch points um, that we could sort of speak to in terms of that social environmental connection, but that's just a few to start on. Great, good, good answer. All right, another question. Um, what are your thoughts on the value of certifications and audits? Um, mm. Yeah, I would definitely say that uh, I see them as, as being a step and having a place, but they're not solving this issue, um, which is the estimated 100 and, oh, sorry, I was about to say 130 million. Um, they're, <laughs> they're not solving this issue of the one in every 130 women and girls mm. um, estimated to be enslaved currently. So they're not finding the problems. Um, they do find some problems, but these, these sort of huge global issues um, of social injustice and environmental degradation are still happening. So the traditional audit and certification approaches don't seem to be enough. Mm -hmm. So we've been really trying to look into above and beyond um, processes. Um, an audit is often traditionally a snapshot in time. Yeah. So it takes a, a shot of where um, a supplier or a business is at in a moment in a, in a day or two days of time so they might want you to, that they might want you to see yeah so it's it's a control <laughs> it's it's planned it's controlled um so we're big believers in in looking into um enduring approaches so a way to actually continually see and have insight into um what's going well and what isn't and um that enduring approach is so essential to actually really figure out where the problems lie because if we're not picking up the problems then we're not looking hard enough okay. so Mm -hmm. Definitely, I'd say that there's um, big gaps in the certification and audit area. We we definitely look for certain certifications, but as we learn more about the gaps in each of them, then we've also then got to take another step to see what could we do to, to fill that gap. Um, the, the Global Organic Textile Standard is a certification that our um, denim all has. However, as I learned more about it, I realised the social standards were only monitored from the gin level, not from the farm level. So there was this gap then in mm -hmm. um, the social standards for the farm level for yeah. that certification. And so, yeah, learning that then just changed our approach to, okay, well, now we need to do something to actually understand the social standards on the farm level because mm -hmm. it's being missed with yeah. this particular certification. So basically in short, yeah, you've got to know what's being certified. Mm, uh, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, it does really answer the question because it's all it's a tension that I'm that I'm seeing in a lot of uh, companies, particularly smaller entities. Um, you know, how much you know it's the investment. How much do I need to invest in this? You know, mm. and uh, a lot of uh, organisations are still at the nice to have. This is a nice to have kind of level. Um, their readiness, uh, for example, to comply with the Australian Modern Slavery Act. Um, you know, is uh, you know there's this tension between lack of um, capacity or resourcefulness uh, and, a, and a lack of desirability really like a, an urgency so and that all will determine where money spent uh, because yeah it seems to be it's an investment in time and effort and that that implies money as well because you've got to release people to mm -hmm. actually take the proactive stance so you know that's yeah that's a big takeaway for me at the moment is yeah from what you're saying is there is an investment and you have to be proactive in doing that mm -hmm. Uh, another question. So how do you and the design production team work together, uh, particularly managing tensions with performance and cost with sustainability criteria, um, yeah. brackets, suppliers and types of fibres? Mm, I think that's an area that I feel like 
I want to improve as a business because um, it can be really challenging with, yes, the needs of the production de design and production and buying team and the sustainability criteria that I'm trying to work through with a potential new supplier. So currently um, the way that I'm, I'm doing it, and this has room for improvement for sure, but is I'm doing a little bit of an initial assessment with a supplier when they first had that first touch point. So the design team hasn't invested a lot yet um, with the relationship and with the sampling and so on. It's just that first touch point, and it gives me a chance to quickly, without taking too much time from the supplier or myself, flag some possible um, red flags if there are some early. Um, and then I start to go deeper as the relationship progresses. So there, there is a tension to it, though, because um, obviously the longer the, the, the design and buying team have been working with this supplier, um, the harder it is for them to, to, to move if they need to. But um, that seems to be currently the system that we're utilising. So I'll start with an initial assessment and to flag any um, issues early on before they've invested too much time. And then as sampling begins, I, I dive deeper and then start looking more into what evidence do they have? What will they be transparent about? I'm not looking for perfection in a supplier, but a willingness and a transparency go so far because um, we can work together then on so many things. Um, so that's uh, kind of how we're balancing that at the moment. Um, and then, yeah, looking into, like you said, with things such as cost as well, the region, certain regions might be a lower cost, but a higher risk in areas. So it's a constant juggling act of, um, and also timeframes and timelines as well. So it is a constant juggling act. And I don't think we have a perfect process yet, um, but always trying to develop and find another way that we can pick up issues earlier. Um, and therefore the buying team has more time to, to look elsewhere if that's necessary. Well, yeah, I think from what you're saying, I mean, you know, um, collaboration and and, uh, and and relationships are mm -hmm. highly important. Um, there is a role, obviously, for technology uh, in, in traceability and transparency, but at the end of the day, it's about relationships and building trust mm -hmm. so that uh, someone, if someone, if you want someone to be uh, honest and transparent about what they're doing, it does require a high level of trust and that, that can yeah. vary um, from culture to culture. Uh, even within a, you know in, within a country so and that 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 needs to be um, cultivated over time exactly um, that's yeah. the hard thing isn't it because it's hard to get a deep dive when you're a new relationship for that supplier so yeah. the supplier is more willing to to provide more as the years go on sometimes or when they've had a certain commitment so um, I like to explain early up that a long-term relationship is in our best interest and in your best interest yeah. okay um, so that that's um, sort of a given from the beginning. I remember one supplier saying they've been burnt by brands before. So providing a lot of insight into the supply chain um, concerns them because they've had brands utilize that and then go elsewhere or market that and then go elsewhere. So yeah, you are working with different cultures and different experiences and each case is so different, each supplier. Great, great. Well, you're yeah, happy to uh, keep answering some questions because they're uh, they're, <laughs> they're coming in, which is great. Thank you so much. For, uh, I love I love the questions. So another question. So there are many service providers that provide due diligence and advisory services in human rights and modern slavery. Uh, what different different differentiates? Sorry, the excellent ones from the good ones. Mm, so I'm just reading that question again to make sure. <laughs> There are many service providers that provide due diligence and advisory services in human rights and modern slavery. What differentiates the excellent ones versus the good ones? That's such a good question. Mm. My, my first thought is results, seeing what, <coughs> what impact and results have come out of these providers. Um, I'd, I'd really want to hear about um, the case studies, the projects they've done, the impact on people. Ideally, hearing from the people that have been impacted mm. um, is is golden to be able to do that. I know I know for us that's something we as this program, um, this due diligence program on that raw materials level expands, being able to pick up on um, the impact of say capacity building or remediation, but then actually hearing from those same people that initially shared with us their concerns or their situation to say what impact they've seen or what differences they have or haven't seen. Um, so I think they would be sort of key areas I would look for, but I probably, yeah, I think that's a great question, but that's probably the first couple of thoughts that would come to mind around mm. looking into some, some options, actually mm. understanding what impact have they seen? How did they get that impact? Mm. 
I think for me, yeah, in addition to that, I think, um, you know, uh, I'd be looking for uh, service providers that are actually willing, that are survivor focused, um, mm. that actually care about local if possible, <laughs> local and, and that can actually care about the, the, the people and the, and the situation, yeah. not just, um, just, okay. you know, because there's lots of organizations that can spout out all sorts of data and reports um but it can be meaningless so i think someone that's a, a, an organization that's willing to go the distance that's there for the long term mm. that is deeply committed to the to the country and the culture and the language um to understand the needs and and mm. to um yeah really do the do the do the journey i suppose do the part being be involved in a partnership because it's um it's not a one hit um mm. it's not a one hit kind of dynamic it's it's a it's definitely a process uh and and having a long-term commitment because uh, it can be very slow a slow burn as well so okay mm, well said yeah okay we've got one final question um how have you advocated to gots um, about the certifications gaps at the farm level Mm. There's still a lot more to do in that area. We've been um, chatting a bit more directly with the textile exchange um, and just sharing a bit about the gaps and then the work that we've been doing since, since understanding those gaps. Um, but but the, the exciting thing for us is now even, even the supplier that we, um, our key denim supplier also wants to, um, I guess, keep those conversations going with Textile Exchange and GOTS for that broader coverage. So currently the supplier themselves have been stepping in with more social um, standard initiatives to actually understand uh, more about what's happening on the farm level. Um, the supplier actually recently said in a, in a panel um, that, to be honest, they hadn't realised about that gap with that particular certification. So... Um, they want to step stand with us to start advocating. So I think there's still time to go with that. There's still definitely more time needed and um, more energy to be spent yet mm. on promoting that. So for us thus far, it's been more of a proof of concept stage of um, how does this enduring program look? Is it actually having the impact? We hope it has, um, but that would be some conversations still to have more directly with GOTS, um, but also currently with Textile Exchange. Perfect, great. Wow, um, that's so great. Well, thank you so much, um, Lisa, for answering those questions. And thank you too to uh, those in attendance for yeah, asking those questions. Much appreciated. And, uh, you know, um, both myself and Lisa are happy to answer more questions if you want to uh, be in touch with us and we'll put our details up in a minute. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, we wrap up, uh, Liesl, um, three, three main takeaways from today. Oh. My three main, <laughs> your main takeaways. Oh, I'll have some takeaways. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think I think it's probably I mean being covered a lot of the heart of why we exist, but I think it's the yeah, genuine desire is mm. where it has to start. Um, like you were saying with finding service providers as well, that genuine desire is so important. Has to be so much more than ticking boxes. Um, and I think that change of mindset of actually looking for the issues rather than just hoping that they're not there and, and trying to prove that. Because um, if we're not actively being part of, of mm. finding solutions, then we're definitely part of the problem. Yep. Um, yep. So I think that's a big one. Uh, going for a more enduring approach to due diligence rather than that snapshot in time mm -hmm. that we've, as an industry, relied on mm -hmm. um, is, is a big one too. And I think my last one would be um, collaborating with like-minded mm -hmm. brands, um, with whether it be other experts, NGO groups, others that just have more experience in these areas of need than we do and learning from each other and um, combining forces to actually, yeah, to make some impact. Yeah, and, 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 and those three points, you know, um, they all play, they all work together. So you can't, mm -hmm. um, you can't have an enduring piece without, you know, or you, sorry, you can't have a, a, you can't collaborate, I suppose, without the endurance. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trust and partnerships and, and, and all work through, you know, a long, a long term engagement um, and, a, and a willingness to listen and, and be attentive to what's going on around you and, and doing that over the, the long haul. So, mm -hmm. perfect. Wow. Well, it's, um, it has been a delight, uh, Lisa, to have you uh, uh, join us today. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, it's been great. A really good discussion. I've uh, learned a lot uh, about Outland and, and the work that you're doing. And uh, I just, it's for me, it's, yeah, a really clear um, model. I know that, uh, I know you're not perfect and I'm not, uh, you know, but, but I think that's part of it too. I think not uh, putting yourself out there saying, well, we do this and this and this and, you know, um, so, and you're right, you're probably right. Sustainable is not, not the best word um, because it's just, 
yeah, there's a lot of greenwashing and, and social washing that's going on. So I think, yeah, being, um, yeah, being willing to um, be open with your, your customers, um, your investors, um and and the communities in which you operate uh, about what you're trying to do and and the challenge and face those challenges um so and it just obviously brings great results it's brought a lot of respect uh to the brand and uh, a lot of value to the brand as well so that's it's excellent um yeah i want to thank everyone for joining us today uh we thank you once again for your questions i'm just going to share um my screen um and here we have, uh, yep, yeah, just our, our details. Um, so if you want to connect with Liesl, that's her email address, and she's happy to answer any questions. And there's also the email address for Outland. You can also connect with Unchained. Um, I've got a bit of a fancy QR code there, which you should all be used to using these days, uh, which will <laughs> connect you uh, with me. Uh, but if you'd like to be in touch uh, with Unchained Solutions and what we do to help companies to address the risk of modern slavery and to comply with the Modern Slavery Act, uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you um, as well, if that is your need. So yeah, we, um, we wish you well in your endeavors to, uh, as you consume um, more consciously, more ethically, um, and also as you perhaps make, look to make and source your products more ethically. Um, yeah, who knows? Um, I hope today has planted a seed perhaps for some other uh, budding uh, entrepreneurs perhaps, uh, or even just com you know, existing brands to, yeah, yeah, to do a lot more to address uh, risks of forced labor and modern slavery in, this, in the, the supply of their products and to, yeah, to look for really um, viable solutions, um, yeah, to make sure that the products that they sell are being, yeah, sourced and with great adherence to environmental and social and, and economic issues as well. So thank you. Just leave the screen up for a little bit if we can get these details yeah thank you Stephen thanks so much for having me thank you hang on a second let me end the meeting